Hi everyone, I'm Glenn Daniels from the University of Antwerp in Belgium and the research institute IMEC. I will be presenting our work towards slot bonding for adaptive MCS and IEEE 802.15.4e dish networks. The question that we ask ourselves for this paper, for this work, is how do we optimize the network performance for these scenarios that you see on these pictures? These are typical industrial settings in which, in which there is a lot of metal, large metal blocking constructions that interfere with your wireless signal. So it's very challenging to have a good wireless signal. Now, we realize, of course, that in the last decade, there was a standard, there's a standard uh, 802.15.4 um, standard that is becoming, or that was very popular to be employed in this type of situation, these types of situations. It includes a set of file layers and MAC layers to, um, be, to be used for low power wireless mesh networks. And in particular, there was one MAC layer, the dish MAC layer, that is very popular. We have a picture of it here. This dish MAC layer actually employs time slotted channel hopping, in which time is divided in different time slots, and every node sends at a particular slot in time. So, as you can see here, Y sends at time slot 1, while node Z sends to X at time slot 100. It also actually employs channel hopping, meaning that for every transmission of the same nodes at the same time slot offset, you do actually hop to a different channel, to a different, um, yeah, to a different channel. So you try to mitigate multipath fading effects and external interference. And these both things, this time slotted schedule and this channel hopping makes your Mac layer very energy efficient because if you don't send, you need to sleep but also very reliable because you try to avoid this ex external interference and multipath fading effects. However, we, re we realize that TISH is still limited by one thing, by the chosen modulation of the network, because all the, all the nodes do all their transmissions with the same modulation. But if your modulation doesn't fit your network requirements, for example, in terms of transmission rates, processing time, energy consum consumption, or data rates, your, net, your network performance will still not be good enough. So how can we solve this? And this is what we do and introduced in the paper. We want to introduce multiple MCSs, multiple modulations in one dish network. So you can actually tailor each link to the perfect modulation for that particular link. If you need a link which is from a node to its parent, which are very far apart, we take a modulation with a very long transmission range and so on for all the other links. So if you have a link which is very short, you can, for example, pick a modulation which is very fast to have a very good connection, a very fast connection. Now, if you look at all the different modulations, we have to look at the 15.4G amendment of the 15.4. Uh, 15.4 standard, which, which introduced uh, modulations like SunFSK, Sun uh, QPSK, but also the OFDM options. And here in this table, we actually show one particular OFDM option, option four, which all require, so all these MCSs that you see, all require a 200 kilohertz bandwidth, so all the same bandwidth, but they still have a different data rate going from, as you can see, MCS2 with 50 kilobits per second to MCS, MCS6 in the bottom of the table with 300 kilobits per second. Now, if you want to map this into a TISH schedule, and you imagine this TISH schedule having time slots of 10 milliseconds, like you can see here, or 30 milliseconds, this means different things. For 10 milliseconds, if you want to use MCS2, you will actually need to bond, to put together three different slots of 10 milliseconds, while for 30 milliseconds, you only need one slot. And the same for MCS6 at the bottom of the table, because the radio time is only six milliseconds, there it will suffice to only use one 10 milliseconds regular slot. And of course, for 30 milliseconds, you can also use one regular slot. But this means 
that for 30 millisecond slots, we will waste a lot of air time, slot time in the schedule. Well, if you use 10 millisecond slots at the left side, you will try to fit bound together only as much uh, slots as needed. While with 30 millisecond slots, you will always waste some air time, some slot time. And this is actually exactly what we introduced and proposed in this paper. We introduced the, the concepts of, sl of um, slots and channel bonding. So again, here is a picture of slot bonding, where you see that for node X to the root, we need to bond three slots together uh, to use modulation one, and then we have 30 milliseconds bond slots, while for node Y, we have to bond two slots together, and then we have 20, mil 20 millisecond slots to use modulation M2. We also introduced the concept of channel bonding, where you have to do the same with different channels. So if, if you normally have a channel bandwidth of 200 kilohertz, but the modulation needs, needs 400 kilohertz, you can bond multiple channels together to, to accommodate this modulation. But in this paper, while introducing also channel bonding, we primarily focused on slot bonding and the analysis of this slot bonding concept. So how did we do this? We actually used a mixed integer linear programming model to evaluate the feasibility and performance, which had two objectives. One, maximize the packet delivery ratio at the roots, and two, at the same time, minimize the total radio on time. To do so, we used two decision variables. The alpha decision variable that says where a particular node needs to transmit um, yeah, its packets, so in the schedule, and beta, which actually represents the number of repetitions a particular node n can try per packet with the parameter r. For the exact constraints, we refer you to the paper. So how did we all evaluate this? We did this with a simulation setup in which we looked at OFDM option 4 with three channels of 200 kilohertz bandwidth. We used the energy consumption model, which was based on the first commercial um, available transceiver that supports OFDM and 15.4G actually, and we ignore interference. Our methodology was actually first creating a random topology, which, were, which was generated in the sixth simulator, and each node randomly selects a parent among all the other nodes. Of course, we have to form a tree so all the nodes can reach the roots. This topology is then fed to the mixed integer linear programming model solver, the Rolby, which gives us an optimal solution, an optimal schedule, which then in step three, we give back to the six dish simulator, we, which uses this schedule, this resource allocations, as a centralized scheduler for our six dish or our dish network. And then we run our simulations using that schedule provided by our model. Now, the first result I have to explain is our omega parameter. This omega parameter actually represents the trade-off between the network PDR, the packet delivery ratio, and the energy efficiency. The higher this omega parameter is, the more slots our model will allocate. So that means, actually, the more slots that you allocate, the more energy that you will consume. So you become less efficient, while the lower this value, the lower this omega, you will actually allocate less resources, less slots, so you will actually become more efficient because you will sleep more, and sleeping does not cost a lot of energy. And that's exa exactly what you see here. You see that for the lower values of omega, the energy efficiency goes up, but the PDR also goes down. While for the higher values, 0 0.3 until 0 0.9, actually, the PDR is very high, but the energy, energy efficiency is also much lower because you waste more uh, or you consume more energy uh, by doing the transmissions, by doing more transmissions. Next, we actually compared our slot bonding uh, concept to a naive approach where we just do a time slot that is long enough to accommodate all modulations. So our slot bonding approach is here represented by the 10 millisecond bond slots, which are the blue box spots, while the naive approach is represented by the 30 millisecond slots, which are the uh, orange 
um, box plots. So with the 30 millisecond slots, you actually run the risk of wasting a lot of air time uh, for those fast modulations. While with the bond slot technique, you try to fit the modulations as perfectly as possible into the bond slots. And you see this, you see that this um, slot bonding has the advantage of actually fitting the slots better into the schedule because the naive approach has a 30% decrease in PDR in packet delivery ratio because it cannot fit its slots as good as as good as a slot bonding technique into the schedule. When you go more to the right, of course, the contention decreases and also this difference uh, becomes less, but still there's always the scalability advantage uh, in favor of slot bonding. What we also looked at is actually at uh, to which MCSs are chosen when you look at different policies. So when you look, um, when you take different omegas, remember the omegas were the trade-off between the energy efficiency and the PDR. And then we looked at which MCSs does the model, model choose. Remember the lower the, end, the omega, more than the model chooses more uh, energy efficiency, while when omega is higher, it prefer or prioritizes more PDR. The first thing, first thing that we notice is actually that all the MCS chosen resulted in a PDR of, of on average 99%. So this is very high. Then when you when the omega is low, the model actually prefers to not allocate links with a low data rate MCS to because this requires a lot of transmission time, which takes a long time, so you consume a lot of energy. This is intuitive. However, when you increase your omega, when you want to focus more on PDR, you try to allocate more links with this MCS2 because this will give you more reliability and uh, your PDR will be higher. As you can see for the slot bonding handle at the left, you can actually increase this MCS2 while also increasing MCS6. But this is not the case at the right graph where you also try to increase the purple bar of MCS2, but at the same time, you, you have to decrease the number of allocations for MCS6 because you just don't have the, the, the space anymore in the schedule. Because with the slot bonding approach, you're more resource, uh, resource efficient and you can fit your schedule better. And also we saw that with the slot, bond, slot bonding approach, you were actually able to allocate on average 6.7 out of seven uh, links to the parents of the nodes. So six of 6.7 uh, links were or resource uh, links were allocated, while for the 30 millisecond slots, this was only on average around 4.7. So due to this wasted air time, the 30 millisecond slots could actually make less transmissions. So to conclude, what did we do? We introduced slot and channel bonding in IEEE 802.15.4e TISH networks to support multiple MCS in a single TISH network. We performed an analysis using a mixed ILP and we showed the significant scalability advantage of slot bonding over a naive approach with time slots that are long enough to accommodate all modulations. But here you actually waste too much air time. For future work and work that we are working on now is actually improvements to the simulation environment where we want to incorporate interference data, uh, interference, but also real measured modulation data. We also want to improve the slot bonding theoretical model where we want to add decision variables for the pattern selection and also interference. And we also want to develop heuristics that, that show us how to select which MCS and how to adapt MCS but also make MCS aware parent selections and slot allocations. And this will all be summarized in developing heuristics to, pu to be put on hardware. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, please ask. So.